Hello everyone, and um, welcome to the Snap Revised Physics drop-in session. Um, and hello again to quite a few people I see have just been in our physics session on current resistance and potential difference. So hello again, Ultimate Donna S, and uh, everyone else who is uh, joining and about to join. Hopefully, we'll give them a few more minutes to to get here. As it's only just time. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, hi D, if you've got any questions relating to the session we just did. Um, Probably a good time to do anything to do related with that is now. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yes, there's a comment there in the chat. Um, maths won't be being delivered today. So the maths session at 6 p.m. is going to be rescheduled. Okay. Hello again. Hi, Leah. Go on, Ultimate. What's your question? Your questions are not always quick. <laughs> That's not a problem. Go on. Thank you, Khadija, I'm good. Hi, Tamana. I'm waiting for ultimate question now. It's making me wait, it's tense. Oh, okay, you've got the answer. Okay, brilliant. Would I say triple science is hard? No. If science is something you enjoy and your school offers it and you're able to opt for it or you're able to do it, then I would suggest you do it. Um, it's not a huge amount of extra content over the double science reward. Um, it just takes a little bit, uh, it takes some of the areas of the, the normal double science and just takes a little bit further. So you get to do topics which are not in the double science courses. So you get, um, I think in the physics, um, there's more space content and things like that. Um, it's not a huge amount more, you, you still take um, a similar number of exams. You might There might be one more now, I believe, in every topic. Um, but having had a year and now another year of no exams happening, <laughs> Um, difficult to say quite how we'll come back in the year after. But um, no, I would say triple science if you enjoy it. If you enjoy science, like everything really, if you enjoy a subject, then go for it. Um, make sure you're going to get a, a B in it, at least a C in it, I think equivalent. So it's, you know, five, sixes. Um, I think if you find science hard and it's not a subject for you, then double science is enough, um, even if you want to go into a scientific uh, course later on. But triple science does take it a bit further. OK, right, I'm going to move on. Uh, my favourite part of physics, oh, I like all of it, I'm a physics teacher, but I guess um, quite a lot of the space and astronomy and also uh, some, some more deep stuff, which I'm not a good enough mathematician to fully understand, but quantum physics and, and all sorts of weird theories about um, the universe and where we're headed. So I am going to move on. Um, very few schools will enter anyone into a foundation triple paper. Um, the problem with triple science was well, not problem, but most triple scientists are selected as the most able scientists. Not not always the case. Not all schools do it that way, but it means that the national result for triple is skewed towards the higher end. Um, so most most triple scientists will do triple higher. Okay, let me talk about what Snap Revise can offer you. Um, I know a lot of you already know this, and I'm seeing um, names that I've seen in the last few uh, sessions. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but for everyone who's doing this recorded and who joins us uh, who hasn't been in the previous sessions, Snap Revise offer three or more classes a week in the GCSE topics available. Uh, the whole curriculum is covered, not by GCSE, but all of the other um, UK curriculums, all the other UK specs. You get high quality handouts, you get libraries of past recordings and availability to these drop in sessions. So um, pretty much one to one support and the ability to uh, when you when you subscribe to be part of a, a smaller support group as well. So that uh, Theory, theoretically, we could have hundreds of people here now. We, we haven't at the moment, but when you subscribe, that's not going to be the case for the for the drop in sessions. You'll be with the smaller groups. OK, so um, you can get a two week free trial. Um, so you can go along if you want one of the lucky winners of a subscription for the end of the year. You can use the code TUTOR14 at the checkout and you can, for a subject, for £49 a subject, you can subscribe and get two weeks for free. And the details are on the website. So just click through to snapprovise.co.uk after this session and you can get your two weeks for free. Everyone can claim that, TUTOR14. Okay. 
So let's have a look at some questions. Um, these are topics that were requested that were covered by students and we've had some feedback over the past few weeks. Um, so let's have a look at the question number one. So electromagnetic waves have a number of common properties. So what are two properties that I'm now sharing the wrong slide. I'm sharing the one with the answers on. Excuse me a moment. I need to share the other one. Right, there will be a short hiatus while I change what file I'm sharing. Excuse me. <laughs> if you've got questions, you can pop them up in the chat if you'd like to. Should have one here. Okay, that's the one I need. Uh, that one. Right, there we go. There's the question again, but without the answers written in. <laughs> you can't immediately cheat. Well, hang on a moment. One of those days today for technical difficulties. All right. Now I have the right thing there. Okay, any questions on this? In the meantime, right, so brilliant, thank you. You've been trying to answer the question while I've been fiddling around with my tech. I'm normally more competent than that, I apologise. Okay, so um, two common properties of all electromagnetic waves, and uh, Ultimus come in there first with uh, they're all transverse, uh, which is absolutely correct. So all um, all electromagnetic waves are transverse, none of them are longitudinal, so that's a very good answer. Um, so there are multiple answers you can give, of course. Let me just go back to the quick slide and turn on my pen. So they are all transverse waves. So electromagnetic waves are transverse. That means, if you remember, transverse waves travel like this, okay? So the oscillation, uh, if it was a mechanical wave, the os oscillation of a particle is up and down at 90 degrees to the direction of the motion of the energy. So all electromagnetic waves are transverse. Brilliant. Anything else we can say about um, electromagnetic waves? It's the same for all of them. A clue in the name, if you think about the word electromagnetic, what is an electromagnetic wave made of? What's it made up of? Boss, meanwhile, has said they all travel at the same speed in a vacuum. Brilliant. That's very true as well. And that speed is, of course, the speed of light, which is uh, thought to be a universal constant. Um, so they all travel at the same speed in a vacuum. That's great. And there are more classes next week, Candy. Yeah, I'm scheduled for another three next week and, uh, well, two and a drop-in session. So Candy, thank you as well for the answer to the question. So um, all magnetic fields are made up of magnetic and electric fields. Um, and even a little bit more detail, they're oscillating at 90 degrees. So they are, this is a third possible answer, you only need to give two, but they're all made of electric and magnetic fields. And those fields are oscillating this is a very high level answer, but it's one that is in the mark scheme for this exam question. Those fields oscillate um, at 90 degrees to each other, which is rather difficult to draw, but I'll give it a go. Um, uh, that's my best attempt. That's brilliant, isn't it? It's an absolute work of art, I can see. <laughs> but essentially, you've got one field, a one magnetic, uh, electromagnetic uh, wave there, and you've got an electric field going one way, and you have a magnetic field going at 90 degrees to it. So they are made up of oscillating magnetic and electric fields. Um, does an electromagnet emit EM waves? Um, yes, because effectively you're, in order to produce an electromagnet, you're putting a current through a wire, normally a coil of wire, um, if that current is oscillating, so if it's an alternating current, then you're moving the electrons. Therefore, you are generating an electromagnetic wave because that is exactly how a radio transmitter works. You send electrons up and down uh, a piece of metal 
And as the electrons, as the current flows up and down that aerial, um, it sends out an electromagnetic wave in all directions into space. So yes, uh, uh, but a DC current will not produce an electromagnetic wave. So only when you turn it on and when you turn it off, will you get an electromagnetic wave from a DC current. Okay, just looking back at the questions. And yeah, sorry, it does look like DNA. My mistake. I'm sorry, Evan. <laughs> um, I, please don't ever ask me to draw DNA for you. If, if this looks like DNA, you want to try and see my DNA. Right. Okay. So are we thinking of any other things we can say about electromagnetic waves? What can we do to an electromagnetic wave? What can we do to all transverse waves? We pass them through a really narrow gap, a really narrow slit in a, in a, in a, in a something solid, perhaps. Um, Callie, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Yeah. Uh, what can we do to transverse waves if we pass them through a very, very narrow gap? It's something you might know about if you bought special glasses for fishing or for skiing or where you want to reduce the amount of reflected light going into your eyes. It might not be a word you've come across. Um, and I'm going to tell you so as not to keep you in suspense for too long. So what, what we can do to transverse waves and all electromagnetic waves is we can polarise them. Uh, I spell it with an S. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Could be spelled with a Z. Um, so all electromagnetic waves can be polarised. They can be passed through a gap and you can filter out waves at different angles. So you just have the waves that are in one plane going through with the electro and electric and magnetic components. So polarized means um, okay. In so I'm trying to think of the right words here. So in the incoherent light, which is light that is coming from all directions, like the light reflecting off my head at the moment. Uh, incoherent light is not polarized. So the light waves come in at different angles and they're scattered at different angles in all directions. If you make light, um, if you polarize light then you, you, separate, you separate out, you, you take out all of the waves of light that aren't in a particular direction or, or in a, oscillating in a particular plane. So polarized light has a, a single plane of oscillation um, rather than multiple planes of um, scattered incoherent light. So it's, it's, it's a complex thing. I would have a look, a closer look at it um, yourself, um, ultimate, because it's quite hard to spend much time on that one now. Boca and candy too. So yeah, have a have a further look in your text because I could talk about that for probably a whole lesson. Yeah, it is in the waves topic. Okay, so there's one question. A few properties of electromagnetic waves. Let's have a look at another one that the, the examples love to throw at you. Um, I will say that for A level, you do need to memorize. I know this is a GCSE session, just to remind you, make you happy that this is still GCSE, but for A level, you need to know the ranges of the different parts of the EM spectrum. So all seven parts. Um so the point, sorry, going back, Kelly, I apologize, going back to the previous question, um, you only need to make two of any of these points. So we've got, they're all transverse, they travel at the same speed in a vacuum. Um, they're all made of electric and magnetic fields that oscillate, that's what we need to say, can be polarized. You don't need to say what that means. Any one of those is valid for a mark, up to a maximum of two marks. Right, let's have a well, let's have a look ultimate. Let's have a look at this question. So one's been done for you, and that's really helpful because you can answer this question with a little bit of understanding and some deduction without having to really remember what the wavelengths are. OK, if you remember the EM spectrum, you've got long waves and then they get shorter and shorter and shorter and then very, very, very short waves up at the end. So it's quite hard to do that on a graphics tablet. But up here, you've got gamma and then you've got the X-rays and then you've got UV. And then you've got uh, visible light. And then you'll have infrared. And then you'll have um, microwave. And then you have radio waves. Now, one thing you do need to remember is the order. And it can be displayed in either direction. OK, so you might find a wave that starts with a gamma and then gets longer to radio. You need to know that the longer waves are going to be your radio waves and the shortest waves they're going to be your gamma waves. And there are all sorts of things you can do to try and remember the order. So radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma. Um, the one I tell my students is not very rude, but it's slightly rude, so I probably shouldn't say it. Um, but you can remember a mnemonic. You can make up a little rhyme to help you remember the order. So let's have a look at a question. 
let's have a look at what ultimate's written there so I'm, I'm thinking of mine in the morning now as i read it radio microwaves infrared visible ultraviolet x-rays gamma yeah if you come up with a sentence with those capital letters at the beginning of the words it helps you so radio waves are there um we've got some very very short waves here and we've got some the longest waves are here and we've got one that's in the middle so there's the one that's in the middle they're the short ones and they're the long ones now let's sort the remaining three into middling, short and long. So what's the shortest wave of the three we've got left? The shortest wave, boss is giving the answer there. Um, so the shortest wave of the ones we've got left is gamma. And um, we know gamma is shorter than ultraviolet and infrared, so it must be the answer. Um, the longest wave here, ultraviolet and infrared, a different size of the visible spectrum. And the longest wave is the infrared side. So we've got to go to infrared for the next one. So the, the longest one, rather, the longest one is infrared and the middling one is going to be ultraviolet. OK, so gamma, ultraviolet and infrared. Are we happy with that? Yeah, infrared is longer than visible light. Ultraviolet is shorter than visible light. So you get a straightforward pattern for the answer there. Uh, any questions on that? Red Marshals in London use X-ray goggles. That's cool. I like that. And it's completely, completely publishable to every film, which is always good. Good. Infrared. Yeah. OK. So just remember, you can deduce these things. You can work them out. Um, but it's good to try and remember these, particularly if you're going to go on and do um, physics at a higher level. All right. Next question then. So um, electromagnetic waves are frequently used for the purposes of communication. Hi, Pengu. Um, we're doing a drop-in session now. We've, um, I've just been teaching a session on um, resistance and potential difference in current. So a lot of people here were in that session and we had a few further questions. But now what I'm doing is going through some past exam questions. Um, I have the mark schemes in front of me and I can talk about your answers and how they relate. And there's a mixture of topics, Pengu. So we've just done electromagnetic spectrum and now we're moving on to another electromagnetics question. OK, so Electromagnetic waves are used for communication. Radio waves are used to transmit TV signals. Uh, what can we use for remote controls? You're welcome, Pengu, no problem. Um, so, hi, Rockstar. Um, so, all of you, what, what part of the electromagnetic spectrum would tend to be used for remote controls? Uh, oh, interesting. Um, Right, right. Some, some remote controls can be radio, but that's very, very rare. You're really only looking at things like uh, remote control doorbells and things like that, which is a form of remote control. Um, remote controls, you normally have to point in the right direction, don't you? So what's the answer? Is it going to be radio, microwave or infrared? You've got to point it in the right direction. If you look at the end of remote control, there's often a little window on it, which is a bit of a clue. Or you can even see a little round thing, which is a form of LED. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, Tamana and Dana. Yeah, and others who said it. So the remote controls tend to use infrared. So yeah, it's effectively heat. Infrared is heat, but it's a very, very, very low energy um, source of infrared. And it's 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 basically modulated, sends a little signal out of ones and zeros to whatever you're controlling. And light can be used to do that very quickly. So infrared's good. What about mobile phones? Some people, some students are quite surprised about what mobile phones use. Um, so we've got a question there in the, in the answer from Ultima, and that indeed is a question. So what is it? Uh, is it microwave or is it radio? The phones used to use infrared. I can remember the days when you used to put a phone next to another one and their only form of communication was infrared to transfer data many years ago. Yeah, so most of you are saying microwave. Um, so Donna, I understand your point. Obviously, you look at a screen, so the visible light part of it is, is vital. But in terms of connecting to a, a source of data and sending data out, phone calls and so on, who uses a phone for a call now? But it's microwaves. Microwaves are used for mobile phone communication. And microwaves travel really, really well in straight lines. Um, which is why we need so many mobile phone towers everywhere, because you've got to be pretty much in the line of sight to a mobile phone tower for your phone signal to be good. So are we all happy with that? Microwaves for phones, infrared remote controls. Cool, we'll move on from there then. So let's talk about magnets for a moment. So magnets, state the law regarding the forces between the poles of two magnets. So we're not been asked to draw a diagram here. We're just going to state uh, for two marks, so we're probably going to need to say two things. Um, 
sorry, Harris has a question about the last slide. I will, this is the purpose of this session. So just need to pop back for a second for, for Harris. The last slide, Harris, we were just talking about which parts of the EM spectrum. So you've got this spectrum going from long waves to very, very short waves, and I can't draw it very well with a graphics tablet, but you've got radio going all the way up to gamma. So which parts of that electromagnetic spectrum are used for those two tasks, Harris. So we were looking at what would what would a remote control use? Infrared. Um, it uses infrared, which is about here. And uh, there's IR. And then we've got visible light there. And then mobile phones actually use microwaves, which is here. So that's what we were covering on that slide. OK, back to the next question, which some people are answering for me now. So like pel poles repel. That's a good one. Yeah. So like poles sorry that's an e like poles repel so um example north north or south south you put them together they're going to push each other apart like like poles repel um you can state the converse now just to get the next mark um opposite poles attract Opposite poles attract, opposites attract. You could say unlike poles attract as well, even more scientific. But yeah, so that would be north, south, south, north. Okay, thanks, Ibrahim. And hi, Hannah. Thank you. Force of attraction between unlike poles. Good, good. So north, south, or south, north. Yeah, they're going to cause a force of attraction, and like poles are going to cause a force of, force of repulsion. Good. So we don't need to, I don't think we need to um, dwell on that one anymore. Okay, oh, Abraham has a good point. Yeah, you know, when you're drawing the fields, um, if you if you're drawing a magnetic field um, and you've got a north pole of a magnet here and a south pole, I'll just draw a few field lines. Uh, they mustn't go inside the magnet, and they should have an arrow pointing from north to south. So I'll just draw two more field lines. There we go, and one more there. So when you're drawing magnetic fields, they go from north to south, and as you get further and further away from the magnet, they spread out. So Abraham's point of it going from north to south, I'm just explaining what he means by that. And that's the direction that you consider the field to travel in. Okay, sorry, um, I've seen a question from Ultimate there. What's the law specifically called? When you say the law, what do you mean? I'm not quite sure, Ultimate, on quite how to answer that question at the moment. I'm just gonna look through the questions. Um, thanks, Harris and Hannah. Um, yeah, Hannah, it's very similar to Coulomb's law in terms of positive and negatives um, and their attract attractive and repulsive forces. Um, it's the same kind of thing. So, okay, on the question, so state the law. Um, oh, okay, that, that's it. It's not any more scientific than that ultimate. Sorry, I understand what you mean. Yeah, it says state the law. It's, it's just like poles repel, um, unlike poles attract. That's it. Um, it's nothing more complicated than that. No, um, no, there isn't another name. <laughs> it was, sorry, it was, um, yeah, it's, it's a slightly oddly worded question, I'll give you that. Okay, so here's another one on magnets. Um, there's a figure showing a magnet held close to a second magnet, which is suspended by a light cotton thread. Okay, so we've got a magnet on the left here, and we've got another magnet here, which is able to move because it's being hung on a bit of cotton. Um, so what type of pole are we going to find at X? Um, let's have a look. There's an arrow and the question isn't stating, but I'm, I'm guessing maybe there's a little bit of information missing from this question. But that shows the direction of motion of this magnet that's being held on a cotton thread. So it's moving to the right. So what must pole X be? If it's moving to the right, Thank you. Thank you very much. People are saying, generally speaking, they're saying south. It's the south pole. And it must be a south pole because the motion of the magnet is being shown as to the right. So the force on the magnet on the right is to the right. Therefore, there must be another south pole near that south pole to give rise to that force of repulsion. Excellent. Thank you very much, folks. Let's uh, look on at the next question. So the next one, still on magnets. Here we've got a question where we have a suspended magnet again, but in this time, sorry, 
have a suspended object again, but in this time, instead of a magnet, it's a magnetic material. Okay, so it's not a magnet, it's a magnetic material. Suggest two possible materials that the unmagnetized material could be made from. So what, what could that unmagnetized thing be made of? Iron, cobalt, and nickel, Hannah. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Donna, Ibrahim too, thank you. Yeah, iron, I'm gonna list them all, um, but you would. Um, this would be a fully correct answer just there for two marks, iron and cobalt. Um, iron, cobalt, and nickel. And there's one more you could actually say, you're allowed to say, although it's kind of a repetition of iron, and you can say steel. In my mind, I would say avoid it because I think iron is a better thing to say. Steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. So, um, but it's iron, cobalt and nickel, which are the magnetic materials. And thank you, Hannah, you just said exactly um, what I meant. Yeah, and steel can have other things added to it, like molybdenum and other, other metal impurities, which change its properties and change its hardness, ductility and all those things. Um, so iron, cobalt and nickel are the three magnetic materials. Um, so, Harris, that's what you need to remember, um, are that the three magnetic materials are iron, cobalt and nickel. And that's just something that you is part of the required knowledge you need to retain. Um, so that magnetic material, if you look at the force, which is towards the magnet, um, it's, um, it's being attracted towards the South Pole. It doesn't have a pole on it at the moment, so to speak. It doesn't, it doesn't have a pole on it naturally anyway. But when you put it near to a magnet, a magnetic material will develop a magnetic pole pair. And we'll come to that in just a minute. So I hope that explains that bit enough for you, Harris. And three answers are iron, nickel and cobalt there. That's what it could be made of. So a little bit more detail. Ibrahim, it would always attract... Um, only those three metals, Tamana. So only iron, cobalt, and nickel are magnetic. There are some rather exotic magnetic materials, to be fair, that are now in production and often used, but you don't need to know anything about them for the GCSE. So I'm talking neodymium magnets, you know, magnets which are made of very exotic um, alloys and mixtures of metals, including cobalt, nickel, and so on. And they are the kinds of material that really powerful magnets are made of that are giving rise to the you know, revolution of electric car motors and things like that. But come back to GCSE, you just need to know the magnetic materials are iron, nickel, and cobalt. Um, so, the question was about a permanent magnet on the left and what material would be attracted towards it? That, that's it. Yeah, just those, that's it. Cobalt, nickel, or iron. The next question requires a little bit more. So this one talks about the same question. So the, the unmagnetized material is attracted to the magnet by a process known as magnetic induction. Not electromagnetic induction, magnetic induction. Um, Lady, I think there will be, uh, well, there definitely will be. Um, they are presented by a colleague, so I just look on the website for further details. So Gertie's got an answer there for us. Induced magnetism is when a magnet in a field of a permanent magnet. Um, yeah, um, not a magnet, but a magnetic material. So when you put a magnetic material in the field of a, a permanent magnet, it induces a magnetic pole on the magnetic material. I'm looking at a Sears answer there. Magnetic induction is when a magnetic material is magnetized as it's present in a magnet's magnetic field. Yeah, and it will be attracted. Dana, induced magnets become magnetic only when in a magnetic field. Yeah. And a magnet can only attract a magnetic material, not repel it. Good. Yeah. Oh, Ibrahim, an alloy. We, we talked briefly about alloys. So it's not a relevant uh, word for the topic we're co covering now, but um, an alloy is a mixture of different metals. Um, and I, I, it came up because we talked about some quite advanced magnets being made, which are made of mixtures of different metals. So a permanent magnet is, is a magnet which has um, permanently orientated magnetic domains. So a permanent magnet is a magnet that's always magnetic. It's the beginning and end of what you, well, how you need to describe it. You, you won't need to um, say a lot more about them. Um, and Hannah has given a good answer there. It's a, it exerts a magnetic field. Um, if an unmagnetized material enters it and gets it, it'll get uh, a magnetic field induced on it and it will be attracted to the magnet. All correct, all good. 
So here, yeah, um, you can draw a diagram to help with your answer. So I'm going to draw a little diagram. I'm just going to have a look at my reference diagram down here. We've got prepared. Um, if we have a magnet, yeah, it could be a north or a south pole for the sake of argument. There's a south or north on the other end. There we go. And if we put our magnetic material here, So you would be awarded some marks for a labeled diagram in this case. So in our, in our magnetic material, which would always be attracted, as Anna said correctly, to the permanent magnet, what pole must be induced here for those to be attracted, a north or a south? So we've got our magnetic material, that could be iron, cobalt or nickel, and Dana's given a correct answer there. Um, so that must be a north pole induced in this magnetic material here, which would cause a south pole to be induced over there. So that's a temporary effect. If you take the magnetic material away from that magnetic field, it's going to lose its magnetic poles and become just a piece of metal again. So yeah, north, north or south, north or south, and it's going to be north. You, everyone's put the correct answer up there. That's brilliant. So in terms of what magnetic induction is, Hannah explained it really, really well in her um, answer earlier. So it's when a non-magnetic uh, material is held close to, so non-magnetic material is held close to a magnet that it induces magnetic poles in the non-magnetic material, oops, sorry. Such that it causes it to be attracted. So such that they, oops, attract. Uh, to be fair, Hannah gave a more succinct type to answer in the, in the chat that I can scribble out uh, quickly in front of you. Okay, so, if we use a compass which contains a permanent magnet, we find that we know as North Pole is, yeah, that's true. Yeah, very true, Hannah, yeah. What we call the North Pole is actually being detected by the, the North Pole end of the, of the magnet in a compass. So the North Pole is actually, the ge geographical North Pole is actually the magnetic South Pole. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, if you want to look into more of that, it's quite interesting. The news recently, it's being reported that our magnetic pole is likely to be flipping soon. And they've linked the flipping of the magnetic poles to the extinction of Neanderthal human species or Neanderthal species. So uh, interesting, uh, it will change the way we're protected from the sun's solar rays. Have a look at that. It's quite an interesting bit of science. Let's have a look at another question, um, if we can. Um, I just Google it. You'll find it. I don't. don't I'm not. I'm not forecasting uh, global doom here, uh, but the magnetic poles of the Earth do flip, and there's a record of it in the spreading uh, continental plate on the base of the Atlantic Ocean uh, in the iron compounds. Um, there is a, a record of where the poles have moved around. Um, so, scientifically proven uh, evidence and research. Let's move on. Oh, Harris is asking me to go back to the last one. That's absolutely fine, Harris. Not a problem. So. I'll just read through this one more time. And then Harris, if you've got a further question. So when you put a, and something that isn't magnetic, but is a magnetic material, so cobalt, iron or nickel, you put that near to a magnet, the magnet will induce magnetic poles into the non-magnetic non material such that they get attracted. Um, it's a scientific way of saying you put a piece of iron next to a magnet, it'll stick to it because the magnet makes the iron temporarily magnetic. So the south pole of a magnet will cause a bit of iron near it to develop a north pole very close to the magnet so that they stick together. But when you take the iron away again, it won't remain magnetized. And that, that process of attraction of a magnetic material to a permanent magnet is called magnetic induction and it can only happen to a magnetic material so it has to contain iron cobalt or nickel induce that means make happen in if you induce something you make it happen um, it's a good question i've had it come up quite a lot so uh, if you induce something you make it happen so electro magnetic induction is making 
um, making a current in a wire. Magnetic induction is making a magnetic field. Uh, you can induce someone to give birth if they're overdue. You know, you can induce, induce means make happen. OK. So when you induce the magnetic field, it doesn't become permanent. No, Penge. Um, so the, the induced magnetic field will disappear when you take away the magnetic material from the permanent magnet. Hi, Amit. So the induced, no, the induced magnet is not permanent. In order to make a magnet or make a magnetic material uh, permanently magnetic, to magnetize it, you would need to move the single pole of a magnet along the surface of the magnetic material in order to make it into a magnet. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail on that because you don't need to be able to repeat any of that. Um, please have a, have a look online, have a look in, in other resources if you have further interest on that. OK, I'm going to move on. So let's think about sound now. Let's look at a different question altogether. So talking about sound. Um, when sound waves enter the human ear, they encounter, they encounter an eardrum and your eardrum vibrates. Describe the process by which sound waves cause the eardrum to vibrate. So what is it that causes the eardrum to vibrate? So it's a sound wave. Good. Thank you. So the first thing is, so that it's a longitudinal wave. We could mention that. Why not? Longitudinal sound waves. What, I'm going to ask a question of you all before you um, before you all get to typing long answers. Um, what kind of um, wave is a longitudinal sound wave, if you think about it? And another way of maybe making you think about it is if you stand right in front of a big bass speaker at a concert or a venue, an event, you can feel the sound. So what else could you describe the sound wave as other than just a longitudinal wave? <clears throat> it's a single word, really, that you could describe it as um, this type of wave. So a longitudinal wave, but you could say in everyday speak, um, you could say it's a, it's a pressure wave. OK, so longitudinal sound waves, they're pressure waves. And Hannah has described it perfectly with the ideas of uh, rare refraction and compressions um, moving in a longitudinal manner. That's what a sound wave is. So those pressure waves, um, that pressure, what does it do to the eardrum? Thank you, Pengu. Brilliant. Thank you, Dana. Excellent. That's that's good. So longitudinal sound waves are pressure waves. So we've called them pressure waves. They um, they cause. Let's think of a word right in this. So they cause the eardrum to vibrate. So they cause the eardrum to vibrate because of changing pressure. So as the sound gets enters your ear canal, the changing pressure in that wave makes your eardrum vibrate. And what must that be doing to the eardrum if it's making it vibrate? What must you do to something in order to make it move? What must you apply to something in order to make it move? Don't forget the question's only asking about the eardrum. So you don't need to go into any more detail about the inner ear. So you've got a pressure wave hitting the eardrum. What's it exerting on the eardrum to make it vibrate? What must you, yeah, thank you, Ultimate. Um, it is exerting pressure. I kind of invited that word because I said exerting and you often talk about exerting pressure, but also you talk about exerting force. Yeah. So force is a word that they're looking for here for another point. Um, you only need to make two points to get a mark. And here are three. So um, the, this exerts a force on the eardrum, causing it to vibrate. So really the latter two Two answers that I've written here, they're, they're one or the other, we could put all of them, but you'd only get two marks. So a maximum of two marks, there are three things you could write to get them. Longitudinal waves consist of right and left vibrations. Yeah, so that's causing the eardrum to vibrate, and those vibrations make sound. So those two things, the, the two main points you've made there, Candy, um, although they're not specifically in the, the, the simplified mark scheme in front of me, I think an examiner reading that will give you two marks. You've described the left and right vibrations causing the eardrum to vibrate. I think there's enough there. 
Okay, good. Thank you, Ahmed. I'm pleased that is okay for you. Um, and there's a little bit of chat going on there about what pressure is and so on. That's great. It's helpful to each other. Good. Okay, let's move on from there and look at a question about a scientific um, sort of method, a process, an experiment. <clears throat> so here we've got uh, two girls standing some distance away from a wall. Um, they're clapping two wooden blocks together. It makes a nice loud bang when you do that. Um, the sound from the blocks reflects from a wall producing an echo. They then continue to clap the blocks together, timing each clap so it's in time with each echo. Describe how they can use the above method to determine the speed of sound, stating clearly what measurements they must take. So this is quite a tricky one, this one. Uh, what measurements are they going to have to take and how could they get the speed of sound from that method? So they're clapping two blocks of wood together and they are then trying to time them, time them such that they're clapping them together when the echo gets to them. So they only hear the one bang. Let's have a look, no worries, I'll talk. Um, so speed is distance over time. That's a good point. So that's something that we are going to need to use. So certainly by stating that somewhere, that would certainly help us get a mark. So speed is equal to distance divided by time. So what are they going to need to measure? So record the distance they're stood at. Thank you, Evan and Hannah. Measure the distance from the wall. So we're going to measure distance from wall. Good, good. What to, now think about this, you know the distance, so that someone's already done it, Hannah's already thought about it. So I was going to say, think about this, you know the distance to the wall, but how far is the sound traveling when it gets to the wall um, by the time it's got back to you? And Hannah said it, the, the distance or the time it takes is going to be half the time getting to the wall that it takes to get back to you. Um, I'm just thinking about what you said. Um, I think it's better to talk about the, this point in terms of distance rather than time. So how far has the sound wave traveled once you hear the echo? Is it going to have just traveled the distance to the wall? Thank you, Ibrahim said it's two times. It's two times. So the distance, so we measure the distance from the wall and the distance the sound, the distance the echo has traveled, okay, the distance the sound has traveled to come back as an echo. Is two times the wall to person distance. Okay, that's clear. I hope that's clear. So you're making a point there in your answer that you understand that it's not just the distance to the wall, it's twice that distance that the sound has to travel to come back. So if you make a noise by knocking two blocks of wood together, and then you time knocking them together again when you hear the echo, the time in between the two claps of the wood is equal to what? see some good discussion points going on here. I'm just going back in the chat a little bit. So the time, time to travel to the wall and back. Okay, so okay, we need to, I think we need to make the point that we need to measure time. Measure time between the claps of the wood. So measure time between claps. And there's four marks here, and we've made four points already here, but we need to make sure some of these points are not quite at the higher of the three levels yet. We need to show some, some evidence that we know how to analyze these measurements. So we've talked about all the measurements here. So if you actually just wrote an answer and wrote all of these things we've talked about, you'd probably on a, be, be on about a, a high level one answer moving into level two. You're not, you're not quite there for four marks. You're probably still looking at two marks here at a push three. What do we need to do to the information we've got in order to get the speed of sound? So we need to actually show, we've written down the formula. Name the equipment used. Yeah, it would always be good to say with a stopwatch when you're measuring time or with a ruler or with a tape um, if you're measuring distance. 
certainly a good practice to do that always. Um, show an example calculation, um, talk about control variables. Um, it's only a four marker, this one. So I think if it was a six mark question, I'd be in agreement with Samana there. But we don't want to go overboard either. Don't want to give too much. We haven't got that much space to answer this. So I think the final thing to say is that the speed is going to be equal to um, two times the wall distance divided by the time between claps. Okay, that last point that I've written there, if you combined this point, I'm going to put an asterisk next to it, if you combine that point with any two of these, then you would be looking at about four marks for that question. Okay, um, when in doubt, write as much as you can. Just be, just be careful not to write two statements that cancel each other out. Um, but if you're not quite sure what to write and you've got space, then write whatever you think comes to mind that you believe is scientifically correct. But if you only need to make um, four marks, then you generally need to make two or three good points and show some evidence how to do a calculation. Okay, any questions on that one? I've spent too long on this one, I feel I have. Um, oh, sorry, Tamana. Um, can you explain the two times thing? Okay, so we've measured the distance between the person and the wall. If that distance is D, then the sound in order to start here and go to the wall and come back again, that's traveled a path equal to two times D. I hope that helps on that one. Um, Evan, if you go back to the question, um, if, and this is an example of being really careful to read the question because sometimes science paper questions can be a bit of a literacy task. They clap the blocks together, timing each clap so it's in time with each echo. So in other words, every time the blocks Evan, are coming together, it's, it's the time it takes for the noise they're making to go to the wall and come back and then have another clap happen at the same time. Um, we don't cover AMJAD, we don't cover IGCSE. Um, and this is GCSE level, although certainly AS level, you will maybe find a few questions that are a little bit synoptic and cover similar content. But um, we cover the UK specifications from AQA, OCR and Edexcel. Um, IGCSE is a bit different. There is some similar content, but the way that the content is presented and examined is a bit different. Um, so IGCSE stands for International GCSEs. Um, some independent schools set them in this country for their students. And they're often they are set abroad for students um, who can't who aren't taking the UK exams. Okay, so I'll move on from that question and um, have a look at the next one. Oh no, we've done. We are done. We have done. I've done all those questions that I had for you today. So we've got about twelve minutes left. So I can continue if there are any more queries on this one. And just to remind you, you can download. Um, content and slides and uh, yeah, further information, also view recorded sessions from earlier. Let's look at AMJAD, how stationary waves, there will be a wave session. Um, I'd have to look ahead in the schedule to see when that is, uh, but there certainly will be. Thanks, Ultimate, no worries. Um, I'm still here for another 10 minutes, so um, you, you can ask me questions. Wave fronts is a good question. Ahmed, what, what is a wave front? Um, let me just bring up a different screen to share with you. Uh, right. I'm hoping that you've got a white screen in front of you now. <laughs> Let me just expand that. Okay, because you're looking at a very boring white screen. So a wavefront, our uh, question was wavefront. So we have a wave, there's a wave. Okay. Um, if we put waves together, then we can generate wave fronts. These are not terribly well-drawn waves, I do apologize. But if I look at what I've drawn there and I have a look at how those uh, waves line up. So these could be uh, waves on the ocean approaching the shore. I just need to adjust my screen a bit so I can see all the chat while I'm doing this. Excuse me a moment. Um, so the wave, these are transverse waves. There's our beach, for instance. There's our sandy shore. This is coming in from the ocean. So the waves are coming in in that direction. Okay, so there's the direction of the wave. 
And Armid's question was, what are wave fronts? So the wave fronts are the points along the wave where um, identical parts of the wave line up. So in this case, I'm putting a dashed line at what appears to me to be a peak in the wave. And so the waves are going this way and the dashed lines there represent the wave fronts. So in this case, a wave on the ocean, uh, there's a ship. The waves are these, okay? These are transverse waves on the ocean, there's a wave. So this particular wave, um, it has particles. If you put a ping pong ball on the ocean there, if you watched it, the ping pong ball would go up. So up and down, I've just done something horrible with my graphics tablet. The ping pong ball would go up and down as the wave moved from left to right. And that would be a transverse wave. Is it right to say the wave fronts are only seen from bird's eye view as lines? Um, yeah, if you, and let me just share a different uh, screen with you there, because that one seems to have stopped working properly for me. Um, and some blank space. Sorry about that technical delay again. It's gonna work for me again now. All right, you should now see a different screen in front of you again. I'm just gonna see if I can draw in it. Okay, so if you um, if you look at something like a harbour, like here, where you've got waves approaching a harbour entrance, so I hope you can see this now. Take care, Roxar. Bye bye. Sorry about the delay. Though I was sorting out my tech again. Um, and thanks, Ahmed. I hope that does make sense. So these are wave fronts I've drawn now here. So these are your they're your wave fronts. And um, if you if they if wave fronts approach a harbour, you often see something like this happening, which is uh, called. Uh, diffraction so the waves actually turn into curved waves there if you look at a google earth picture of dover harbour you'll see that happening from above so yeah bird's eye view of wave fronts is clearer um as i'm just looking through the questions here we've got random questions if you put a deep ball if you put a ball in deep space where there are no planets or stars how will a ball move it won't um it will remain in its own space time framework um so the universe might continue expanding around it but the ball won't appear to move with respect to its surroundings armor there you go um direction of conventional current when a battery is charging um interesting the current's got to be going into the battery so it would be in the opposite direction to the direction when the battery was being used to power a circuit um focal point of a lens oh Ultimate. That's um, I can, but I haven't got time to do it now. That's a totally separate session, I'm afraid. Um, it's led that even in eight minutes, I couldn't show you the necessary diagrams and do it justice to help you without causing confusion. So I'd rather spend time doing that. Um, let's have a look through these questions. If light travels faster underwater, uh, have a look. if light travels faster underwater, as it can bounce off more, does that mean the speed of light changes? Okay, light actually, Pengu, light travels slower in water because water is more dense than air. So light actually slows down in water. Um, the maximum speed of light is, is considered to be the speed of light in a vacuum. Thanks, Asia, you're very welcome. Um, what is meant by a wave? Um, it's a means of transference of energy by particle or electromagnetic field motion. They can be of various types, mechanical or electromagnetic, stationary. Again, it's another lesson. Um, so yeah, I'm going back through these questions. How is distance between two microphones connected to an oscilloscope equal to wavelengths? That's another, that requires more explanation, Hannah. I'm afraid it's a different lesson. Um, I'm gonna have to pick one here though, aren't I? I'm gonna have to pick one. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go for Hannah's here. The distance between two microphones. Oh, let's think. Um, if you have a loudspeaker here and a loudspeaker there, so loudspeaker one, loudspeaker two, and they're both giving off waves with the same frequency and wavelength, then there will be points where the waves overlap, okay? And if you as a person or someone with a microphone walks along this line, alongside the speakers, keeping your distance away from their, their parallel line constant, 
then you will get a sound wave that gets louder and quieter, louder and quieter, louder and quieter, because of interference between the wave fronts, which are moving away from the speakers. And the distance between two maxima, so two of the loudest points, the distance between two of the loud points will be equal to the wavelength. Similarly, the distance between two of the quiet points, quiet to quiet, will also be equal to the wavelength. So Hannah, I hope that in some way connects with your question. <laughs> okay, the live sessions at Abraham tend to be from four o'clock on to allow students to um, get themselves out of school and ready and settled somewhere where they can, they can go online. So um, generally from four o'clock and into the evening and on weekends. Does Newton's law, do Newton's laws work in space? Yes, they do. Newton's laws work very well. And they work really, really well for space flight. You'll find everything that NASA have just done to put perseverance on Mars would have used all Newtonian physics. Works brilliantly for planetary physics and that kind of thing. Um, what's the value of lead thickness exactly, which stops gamma rays? That depends on the energy of the gamma rays, is here, because the energy of electromagnetic waves varies. Um, because you have a spectrum of waves that goes from long wave to very short waves, but there are bands which constitute gamma. And um, so you have a range of frequencies that represent gamma radiation. You also have the potential for the intensity um, of those waves to be greater and also the amplitude of the waves. So the thickness of lead would vary according to the energy the waves are carrying. Okay. I think I've uh, covered noise cancellation headphones. That's not a good one. How do they work? Noise cancellation headphones, right. They're, yeah, they're really clever. In fact, I just took mine apart because I had some which had batteries that had failed. So in noise cancellation headphones, you've got a little speaker, goes in your ear, there you go, there's a bit that goes in your ear. So you've got a speaker sending sound into your ear. You also have a little microphone on the outside of the headphones. So the sound from the environment is being picked up by the headphones. And that sound is being processed by an integrated circuit. So there's some quite clever microelectronics. And where the outside, so if the outside sound looks like this, the circuit makes a signal that looks like this. And when you add those two together, you get more or less a straight line. So the noise cancelling headphones add something called anti-sound, which isn't really anti-sound, it's just the opposite wavelength to the external sounds. They add anti-sound to your music, etc. And so they can subtract the external noise from what you hear in your ear. That's how noise cancelling headphones work. Right. OK, I think most of you were there last session, so you got to see how to get onto the Snap Revision website. Um, it is superposition. Absolutely right, Evan. It's superposing one sound on another, and the headphones are, are analysing the external sounds and producing an anti-wave, so a wave that is opposite to superimpose upon it. Right. Take care, and I will end the stream now as it's coming up to six, and I wish you all the best and see you next time. Bye-bye.